Amir, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you today? Um, doing very well. I'm super excited to be here and speaking with you. No, excited. We've been trying to do this for a while, so I'm glad we finally could make it happen. Absolutely. Why don't you kick us off with your story? Who is Amir? What's your background? How did you get to uh, what you do today? And, and also do a sneak peek of what you do today. Sure. Um, my name is Amir Emadzadeh. Uh, my background, um, I grew up in Iran. Um, I got my master's from Sharif University of Technology in electrical engineering. I came to the U.S. in 2005, and I went to UCLA to do my PhD in electrical engineering, feedback control, and signal processing. Uh, graduated in 2009. Um, I've been working since then in several different industries. Um, I have worked for semiconductor companies, um, healthcare companies, and also self-driving car companies. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know it's a weird uh, mix, but I can tell you the backbone of whatever I've done in my career and also in grad school and even my undergrad is basically applied math and, and software. So that's basically the common theme of uh, whatever I've been doing. And uh, recently I joined uh, Genentech Roche. I have joined um, the uh, digital uh, transformation office as a director of software and I'm helping them with uh, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, digital transform transformation uh, initiatives that they have, um, uh, which are related to data science, AI, and also generally um, data um, data related um, uh, projects. Yeah, and and I also noticed that you, and I mean, you're being so modest with your background, by the way. I mean, like you were at the self driving company Waymo. Well, first, you know, before we, yeah, even. Um, um, uh, before like Tesla even took over, so you were at the at the origin of self driving as a as a as an approach. You were also at Nvidia, so not any chip manufacturer, the the leading AI chip manufacturer. And you were at Gilead, and then now recently, and this is the flash update that you're actually you know, you heard it here first, right? So you, that that you're now <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been a few weeks. Approach. It's been a few weeks, but you heard it here first, you know. Uh, and, and then you also are an adjunct. You were an adjunct professor at the California Science and Technology University. Yes. Um, and you were teaching machine learning fundamentals. I remember that too, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, I'm a part-time adjunct professor um, at CSTU. And yeah, I teach different um, machine learning AI related courses based on their needs. And Amir and I, you know, for the audience met first in Boston almost six or eight months ago when we were six months ago, maybe. Uh, it was the AI in Pharma Summit, if I remember right. That's correct. Yes. Uh, you delivered an amazing presentation, talked about how you were using all of the modern techniques and, you know, which is a lot more sexy now with chat GPT and large language models, but approaches in machine learning and, you know, uh, um, a, and, and, and natural language processing and deep learning across the entire clinical development life cycle. So I was a huge fan when we heard that and, you know, uh, we've been trying to partner for a long time now, so I'm excited about that, right? So Amir, Absolutely. where in the world is AI today? I mean, there's so much noise, so much of action, so much of uh, excitement, fear, perils, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. your vantage point, where is AI today? I mean, there's been a lot of uh, progress for sure. Uh, so many things have happened. You know, um, AI has been used um, extensively for self-driving applications, as everybody knows, uh, for perception, specifically understanding the world around us. Um, there's been a lot of hype on like replacing human beings um, uh, basically drivers with uh, AI and AI um, related uh, algorithms. Um, I don't think we are there yet. Um, in my mind, we, uh, it's going to take more years and more like uh, technology to, to be able to replace a human, uh, a human's brain with software, only software and be like hundred percent self, uh, like autonomous. But, uh, as, as everybody knows, I mean, you can never deny what's have you know, what's, basically happen and all the achievements, um, especially on the computer vision front, uh, which is basically all the deep learning stuff. Um, I'm more excited about healthcare applications, as you can tell because of my transition, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm biased, but from like um, self-driving and uh, to towards like healthcare app applications, I feel like um, there is so many low hanging fruits. There is so many uh, really useful use cases uh, for everybody, I would say. 
uh, what is unique about healthcare is um, uh, it's not a zero sum game. And what I mean by that is um, everybody benefits from it. Like companies would make a lot of money. Patients with, uh, would, would definitely see uh, the value and, you know, they will be able to access um, the drugs they need and uh, have like much mm, more um, healthy experience when they deal with the healthcare system. And, um, and there's so much to do. And, and they're real applications. And, you know, uh, and a lot of them actually, to me, uh, another really nice aspect of it, they are going to be augmentation to the current processes and procedures uh, within the healthcare system. You're not going to really replace anybody, any human being, but then you would actually make um, their lives easier and also um, uh, it basically improve their experience what in, on, in whatever they do. And again, I have... Um, been um, lucky enough to work on a couple of different initiatives on that front. I'm happy to go deeper into them. Uh, generally, what I'm thinking is, yes, health, um, AI has um, done a lot over the past 10 years or so, and there is so much more that is to come, but it's all about the right use cases in my mind. Yeah, no, it's actually what a, what a fabulous, uh, you know, uh, exploration into healthcare. And I want to dive a lot deeper there. So a couple of things. And one thing you said that's, you know, it's, it's so true. And, you know, AI in general is an opportunity to, like, extend the human experience, right? Be it perception like you did in, you know, in, in um, um, self-driving or like in computer vision and so forth. It could be comprehension, like human natural language understanding. It could be this decision making. It could be all of the above, right? So perception, thinking, action, you know, robotics and so forth. And the 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 beautiful thing which you mentioned, I think it's so true that health healthcare is a, you know, not only can you make that impact, but it's a net positive sum game. It's not a zero sum game, right? Nobody, it's like a, everybody benefits across the entire value chain. And it's just fascinating. I mean, there will be disruption to micro processes and stuff, but overall benefit to everybody is going to far outweigh the, the little disruption that you create, right? Absolutely. So, and the other thing you mentioned, I think it's a huge topic, uh, you know, ever since Chat GPT, and we'll 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 cover all this healthcare, and we'll go back to Chat GPT towards the end. You know, is is the notion of augmentation? And in two thousand, you know, I think two thousand sixteen or something, I I wrote a blog that you know kind of was picked up by many different outlets and stuff called AI should be augmented intelligence, right? That was like when I was founding one of my large com uh, earlier companies. And um, and I, 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 I truly thought we'll actually all as an industry galvanize around that notion of augmented intelligence. I mean, other than being a marketing gimmick, I mean, not everybody, like we went, took an offshoot on self-driving, which I think is relevant and, you know, uh, it makes sense. But then most of the opportunities with AI and powerful, like the bag of tools, like deep learning, machine learning, NLP, ambition, is to augment the human being and the workflow in the picture, right? So absolutely, exactly. Good to believe in that. Um, healthcare, explore that for me. So start with, you know, start from the beginning, right? Where do, where is the opportunity in healthcare? And I know healthcare is huge, right? There is the drug development side of the house, the you know, the personalized medicine side, and there is the care delivery, care augmentation. It's a whole bunch of things going on in healthcare. But how would That's you right. frame it? Like, tell me about how you frame up this opportunity. Yeah. <clears throat> so in my mind, at least the applications or use cases I've been exposed to, um, I, can, I can elaborate a little more. I would say on one front is, um, like you said, drug discovery, which is not really my domain, my domain. But definitely, I'm sure there's a lot more to come on that front. Um, specifically, uh, what I can uh, bring up is how much it costs to develop a molecule and get it to the market. And um, uh, I don't know if you know the ballpark. It costs these big pharma companies um, something around two billion plus dollars from research. And, you know, when they start like re researching a molecule, all the way to the phase three, when you know it's all get you know gets approved, and then uh, the patients can use it. So it's a very very expensive process. So um, I would say um, wherever. Um, you know, in this journey of research from that starts from research all the way to um, getting to the market, you can improve things with AI, you would see the benefit, you would see the ROI. Um, like I said, definitely drug discovery is one of them. But one thing I have been exposed to for the past two, three years is what we call clinical operations. 
And that is basically when, uh, you know, the clinical trial protocol is ready and you got to go find the right patients and basically apply the protocol and collect their data, send it back to your biostatisticians and then basically let them do their analysis. And hopefully when they can prove um, scientifically, mathematically that the drug is safe and also effective, you go to FDA and then you get your drug approved and then, you know, you're good to go. Now, the question is, one of the things that um, is very, very obvious and is a low-hanging fruit is how, you do, how do you find these patients? How do you find the right uh, physicians um, who are going to run these uh, trials for you? Um, can you improve that process? Uh, can pharma companies improve anything on that front? And the answer is actually yes. I mean, there is a lot of inefficiencies there. There is a, because of what happened now with AI, there is a lot of different data sources, but then you, you would need uh, a whole new ecosystem so that you can tap into them. Before, what would happen is, so that you guys know, um, people like a lot of clinical, uh, clinical operations people, what they do is they go with, you know, people like his, people or companies or physicians that they historically work with. And that's that's about it. Like they in their mind, you know, they say, OK, this is a new molecule. It's probably it's oncology. It's breast cancer. OK, let's see. Have we done something similar before? And then, OK, we work with, you know, person A or B, physician A or B, uh, this clinical trial site X and Y. And then let's just go with it. It's as simple as and that as, as that. And then, you know, another thing they really need to understand is how long this is going to take. You know, uh, if I recruit, start recruiting patients today uh, in how long this is going to finish. Um, and and again, for that, you know, they usually what they do is we, they go to these um, uh, third parties called CROs. They provide some input to them. And that's about it. I mean, who knows what these CROs are doing? You know, they just rely on their forecast and a lot of times it doesn't you know it's not accurate enough and then what they have to do is uh, what we call reforecasting so they have to pay them more and more and there's no penalties for you know not meeting the deadline and you know the the forecast i cannot hear you ganesh sorry my bad okay you're on mute I say you know and i want to just interject on one thing right now you're you're so right and not only are you driving the cost and complexity of this process by doing this in the old way but you're also keeping those treatments away from patients. But Absolutely. At the end of it, right? Now, that, that $2 billion and 10 to 15 years for a drug launch, from molecule to launch, right? Exactly. Ridiculous in this day and age, right? Yes. Um, no, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt, but yeah, go, go ahead. But Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on. Yeah, like this trial is, you know, it was supposed to be done in 12 months. Now it's going to finish in 18 months. And what it means is, you're six months behind, and then that means everybody you're, you're paying, like as a you know, as as the sponsor, you're paying much more money to basically finish it, and then the patients are waiting. So it's very sad. It's a sad story. So long story short, I mean, there is a lot of data sources, and there is like we have math, and now there is like these AI algorithms. So you can tap into different sort, you know, uh, sources of data. You can help. Uh, you can use the data to develop, you know, AI based models which help you rank your sites and investigators. It actually, you can come up with mathematical algorithms to rank your countries that you want to focus on and do what we call um, country assessment and do your benchmarking and competitive landscape analysis to see, okay, who else is in this market, for example, who are we competing against to, to gain these patients. You can develop mathematical models to actually do forecasting based on the data that you receive and keep improving your models um, uh, when, uh, when you when we basically you receive new data points and do this whole process more efficiently. And um, all I want to say is uh, on oncology, for example, if you can save one day uh, of, of this delay in your trials, it translates into like onto about five to ten million dollars. So the ROI is there. It's just trivial. Now it's all about um, making sure you tap into right data sources. Then you bring in the new technology for, for example, data ingestion and creating your data models, and then creating all the downstream, you know, um, analytics and and then provide it to your customers. In this case, clean ops people, study teams. So this is one huge area in my mind, and there is a couple of more, but um, I'll just yeah. have a pause. Yeah, yeah, I want to, I want to double click on that, you know, and then like you know, 
I'm very familiar with that space based on our earlier conversation and what we do at Autonomize too, right? So one of the things that, you know, in the clean off space and especially this feasibility phase of trying to understand, you know, how do I find the right site, right countries to launch the trials, you know, rank them, understanding competition, who, where am I going to, who, who am I going to compete with to find patients for the trial? Um, and then just doing the modeling of the timeline, right? Enrollment timeline modeling and so forth. Yep. You mentioned a few things. I think the core thing, is this all comes down to the data sources that you can get access to, right? Yes. And especially in an environment where, like, you know, healthcare data and people treat health data as nuclear data. I mean, uh, you know, but yet you ask someone saying, hey, you have a spreadsheet full of your um, health data of all your past, you know, medical history, and you have a spreadsheet full of your financial data with all your financial history, transactions, bank account numbers. Which one do you think twice about sharing on the internet? And they'll say the financial data. Yet, you know, we, we worry about healthcare data access so much and stuff like that. So yeah. talk about those data sources. I mean, is that available only to a few large pharma? Is that available for everybody? Is there public data sources you can deduce things from? Explore that. Um, both. No, actually, so there are some free data sources that everybody can tap into. For example, uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Everybody yeah. has access to it. There's PubMed. Um, there is uh, data sources like um, um, Sightline, where you can find a lot of information about, like operational data, like information yeah. about sites and investigators, and maybe even like the landscape of the drug. Like uh, you know, Sightline has site trove, trial trove, pharma projects. There is a lot of um, you know um, oncology related data, epidemiology data. Uh, a lot of them you have to go and buy. So. Uh, the good thing is, you know, and, and there, it's a whole new ecosystem now, right? Like there is a lot of companies, actually, their bread and butter is selling this kind of data, curate the data, own it, you know, help you even develop analytics. I mean, they also provide services like that. So um, it's just uh, one, so the data is there. You, you have to pay for it, though. But it's not enough because at the end of the day, you have to aggregate all these different data sources and create your data models. And that's not trivial at all. It takes a lot of work to do that. And to be honest with you, Ganesh, there is no clear cut answer to this problem. Like I've spoken to many, many different um, technology companies. This is a new area. So um, you can focus on you know, the ones which are more important, but at the end, end of the day, it's not like there's no plug and play kind of solution out there. So you have to really focus on your own use case and then try to uh, aggregated, you know, the data sources you need, create your models, uh, implement basically a lot of um, very detailed quality checks and quality, like data quality management pipelines and uh, create your, you know, data lakes to host the data and, or, you know, put all the related governance on top of it. For example, as soon as it gets to patient level data, if you want to look at, you know, um, EHR type of data and, you know, Again, that's another huge source that you can tap into for um, for doing even feasibility. Because at the end of the day, you want to create a patient cohort. So, again, I mean, but then it's not trivial, uh, and a lot of that data is anonymized and all of that. Another thing is you can use, you know, do things like diversity analysis, which is a huge um, new mandate by FDA, which yeah. makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, you would think why it happened. It didn't happen before. Like, uh, you know, in the U.S., for example. Um, one interesting stat I saw is uh, for in oncology trials, only less than 5% of patients are African-American, although they represent about like 13, 14% of the population. So, um, but again, how would you do that? You want to upfront your, in your analytics, you want to tap, uh, you want to take into account this mandate of diversity and then based on that, go find the patients. It needs a lot of work. You have to tap into a lot of diversity data. Different companies own it. You got to get the data, buy it from them, aggregate it towards uh, what you had already, and then build up your analytics on top of it, and then actually take it into account in your mathematical models as well. It's an optimization problem. We call it constraint optim optimization. So um, there is so much there that you can do. There is, uh, but but none of it is trivial. But the data is there. To, I assure you, it's. Um, I would say the hardest thing is to just pay for it and buy it and that, uh, for accessing. But at the end, the, then it's just the beginning of it. Then what you have to do is from there on, curate your data, make it ready, and, and then build your analytics on top of it. 
That's interesting. So, I mean, let's assume that you go through this process and, and you implemented part of this in your last job. I, I know of that. Um, yeah. And it is, so where is the bottleneck outside of the access to data? Building, we have techniques uh, that are in there. How can, you know, is it, is there a, is this a gap in, because of the complexity, you know, do you think the right answer is everybody, every pharma company, or even in some cases, even biotechs, late stage biotechs, should focus on building this capability in-house to go solve this problem? Or do you see this actually emerging as a new standard where everybody can tap into this data, but, you know, they can have the modeling tools to model their own unique capabilities? How do you see this play out? I think based on their own studies and like the therapeutic areas, uh, it, it's very beneficial to big pharma to have to their in-house capabilities. Scope, the scope is going to be dependent on, like I said, what they work on, what's their priorities, what kind of molecules they have and all of that. But I mean, to some extent, like I said, you can go to a CRO and that's what, that's what their job is. But then you are 100% dependent. basically depending on them. And then, you know, if what, and, you know, think about it, like it's actually, it really blew up my mind when I realized, you know, for a CRO, um, you know, how, basically the amount of money they charge you is proportional to how long it takes to do the trial. So you do not have the same interest. Like a lot of times what happens is, I mean, like I said, they, they, they come back to you and say, oh, sorry, I was wrong about my forecasting. They, let's do reforecasting. And then. I mean, if there were like huge penalties involved in these contracts with them, maybe things would be different, but they don't exist. So then what's going to happen is they keep charging you more for another so many months and you have no other way to do it. And even up front, let's say whatever they tell you, I mean, like think about it, clinical operations, these are people who are involved in the operations. You, they're not like analytics people. So they have, I don't think, maybe again, if they can go to their gut feeling, maybe if something is very off, you know, they can use their gut feeling to, to catch it, but that's about it. So in my mind, it does make a lot of sense for like the sponsor to be able to do some sort of analytics, at least as a, uh, uh, as a verification um, yeah. approach to what CROs tell them. No, no, I, you know, like a lot of the uh, big pharma that uh, we work with, they tell us like one of the first things they want to do is actually make sure that they have some kind of a QC QC or quality control on what they're hearing from. And especially like exactly. if you're a late stage biotech, for example, your feasibility is everything, you know, because you know you want to make sure that your decision to go on to trial versus not is going to completely drown the company or not. Right. And then yeah. yet the the whole approach is, you know, you go ask um, um, you go do an RFP with five different CROs, you know, spend an inordinate amount of time just sitting in a room and debating the same thing and writing and all this arbitrary things in their process and stuff like that. It's just like, there's actually a blog and I'll, I'll send it to you after, which talks about someone who worked in that space before and he left and he was so burnt out. And he talks about why are clinical trials so expensive? And mm -hmm. it basically is a critique on the CRO processes more than anything. So, yeah. um, and, and I believe it. I think, you know, that's, I've seen some of the things happen. Okay, so let's move from clinical development, the early clinical development aspect, ClinOps side of it. What are some of the other use cases beyond that? With, uh, with uh, the I would say NLP. I like NLP is real. Like I see, I see a whole lot of different applications of NLP. Yep. For example, I would say a big, big one is generally digitization of what we call digitization of protocols, clinical trial protocols. Yep. Um, like if you can understand what you, what's the logic in um, inclusion, exclusion criteria section of the protocol, that's yep. huge. There's so much you can do with it. You can do per patient burden analysis. You can do physician burden analysis. You can go back to your um, uh, basically clean the people, like the, the people who wrote the protocols for you and give them feedback before they finalize it. You can, you know, based on the, anal you know, the analytics you put on top of um, your, uh, your, um, your protocol using NLP, you can gain insights onto how difficult it is to implement it, how difficult it's gonna be to recruit patients using this current protocol. So you can already develop some sort of um, insight onto what's gonna happen. And that's huge. So you, again, it, it basically saves you a ton of money. 
So that's one thing. And I would say, again, generally, like understanding the protocols and it's complicated. I'm telling you, like there is a lot of, you know, very weird logic that goes into it. So if you magically come up with a very nice NLP model that understands these and then is very um, pre precise and accurate um, and specific, then, you know, it really helps. The other thing is, um, I can. Did you have any comment on this? Or no, no, I know. Like I'm, I'm actually very familiar with it, and you know, we, we, um, again, my autonomize AI. We actually do a lot of work with some pharma on that particular thing, and it's, it's a tough problem too. That said, you know, because there's all this convoluted, you know, double negative logic, and you know, exactly, right? so, yeah, and I get very it. nuanced on it. But you know, the good news is, I'll tell you, you know, this is where I get excited about you know, generally trained large language models, which has got a lot of breadth because it has mm -hmm. the ability or the little knowledge embeddings to understand different nuances and the, the little nuances in human language. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it, it can draw from it. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's like there, it is going to be the, the more of this is going to be around, like how do you package and what something we've been struggling with or like thinking through is how do you package this? Kind of, we have an NLP model, a set of models that does this, understand this very well, understands the logic, Booleans it so it kind of now you have a mathematical representation of that thing that is in there, and we you know one of the things we did with that was actually we the easiest thing to do was use a language model to turn it into SQL commands, so that the hospital sites can actually run it to go find the number of patients for the trial. But I'm very interested in those other use cases. Maybe it's an offline conversation too, on understanding how do you then use that to model the physician burden and patient burden, right? What's your truth table to correlate this output against, right? How do you really measure and match that? I mean, but you, you're exactly right, because if you really look at most clinical trials, fail to recruit. Most clinical Exactly. Trials, more than 50%. More than 50% in the US, they only recruit zero or one patient. That is insane. That is insane. It is crazy. Day and age, right? So, I mean, I do believe that there's, there's a huge, and then a lot of the problems is the upstream problem, which is like, how do you model and design the IE criteria in a way that can reduce the mm -hmm. burden? I mean, I, we, we work with a lot of patient recruitment companies, right? Because that was the early uh, set of you know, captive customers that they found. And they tell us the amount of protocols when they try to uh, design, you know, uh, try to recruit for certain protocols and clinical trials. Um, the, you can see when patients drop off. You ask them question number four, and they're like, I have no idea what you're asking me right now. This is probably not, I'm going to just refer to my physician, right? Mm -hmm. They just drop off. So there's a lot of that thing. How do you simplify the criteria? How do you make it human readable? Exactly. That's, that's the idea. Opportunity. Anyway, got it. Awesome. Let's go to the next one. I, I love this, by the way. This is, we're going really deep in this episode. So go ahead. Sure. And I, I like this topic because I'm passionate about this too. And, you know, that's... Yeah, I'm I know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, the other thing, uh, the other one I've seen is, um, I would say generally, uh, like I said, it falls under the category of inside extraction. Um, let's say um, in medical affairs, yeah. what they do is, you know, the drug is out there, people are using it, you know, patients, physicians are um, basically um, prescribing them. And um, now you want to see what's the general sentiment about this, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they go back, they collect a lot of, you know, um, information. There is like Q and A's. So again, it's all text, right? So what you, if you put some analytics on top of it using whatever NLP model you have and be able to summarize these um, feedback you receive from your customers, your clients. Um, if you can do things like sentiment analysis automatically, which is a fairly explored area in NLP, yep. there's a lot of value there. I mean, it's, it's to me, it's again, it's a no brainer to me. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And in fact, I think we're, we're the other thing, one of the, I'll, I'll just go on a tangent and I'll come back on this, right? Because mm -hmm. I want to go deeper into NLP and large language models a little bit, just as, as an offshoot. And, and I'm afraid I will run out of time. So uh, one of the things is like, um, we, 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 we started looking at um, um, NLP in general as a huge opportunity yeah. And there's a lot of data and it's a lot of textual data. So it's all, how do you model human knowledge? Because human knowledge in you know, a language is the window to a human being's soul, right? So language is the window to the soul. So you can really understand intent, you know, a uh, lot, lot more things than what the words say, right? Like you said, yeah. sentiment, but, you know, even other things and stuff. So one thing that, uh, you know, we, we, we've been 
I've been hearing when we talk to uh, a lot of, so I did a webinar yesterday, Finn Partners and uh, arranged it uh, called, uh, it's around generative AI. So a lot of hype and a lot of things around content generation, you know, not just summarization, not just the extractive summarization, but more abstractive summarization capabilities around you know, generating new content from scrap, from from uh, from zero and things like that. Let's take this exploration in that direction, if you don't mind me asking, right? Sure. So, um, Large language models, yeah. Uh, GPT three, GPT, you know, Chat GPT with GPT four. Is la large language models the future of um, deep learning in general? I mean, is that are we going to use language as the way to model the world in infinitum, or you know? And then what are your what are your thoughts on it? And how applicable is it to all the things that you just mentioned? All these use cases that you know that are more narrow, more specific and how it requires you to really understand the domain and solve a problem. So give me a con uh, you know, your thoughts around that, that topic. Yeah, I mean, for these applications uh, that I have described so far, like things very you know, specific to protocols, for example, or um, clinical trial um, documents like SOPs, SAPs, stuff like that. I, um, it's just my two cents, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think having a general um, model like you know chat gpt would help much actually in, in fact what i think is very beneficial in these applications is basically to do transfer learning and do like basically trainings on your your specific use cases mm -hmm. because it's not a general problem really by nature where llms come in in my mind is for more generic applications for example one thing i we've been um I've been thinking about it a lot because actually in the same conference that we met, um, mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were at dinner the other night with some colleagues and people were talking about using chatbots generally uh, as your primary care physician. That I think in my mind, it's not a bad use case. I mean, think about it. A lot of times what we do is we go to Google, even be before going to any doctor or anything, you and just Google it. Yeah. 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 So now, and this is before ChatGPT. This is like eight months ago, and now all of a sudden we had we have you know ChatGPT. In my mind, man, that's awesome. I mean, I can talk to it, and then you know I can treat that ChatGPT as my physician, as primary care physician, at least to some extent. You got to be careful about these things. Yeah, I would say on the on the physician side as well. This is awesome. Like a lot of times, I know that my friend, I have a lot of friends who are physicians. They always Google stuff. <laughs> you know, you at so yes, yeah. I mean, well, research, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Actually, I would say it would revolutionize the way, you know, this whole medicine domain is going to work because you remember like the way I know it, like my, you know, again, you have to memorize so many things. You have to go to these huge books and, you know, pass this test, pass this. Why would you do that anymore? I mean, uh, why would you memorize all this stuff? I mean, when you can quickly talk to some digital model and get really, really uh, accurate answers. So and I think that's that's my thought on that. No, no, and it's actually you know a few things that you, you're 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 touching upon, right? One is, well, generally, language as a way to model knowledge is is pretty huge. So I'm very excited about large language models in general and stuff. That said, broad models really support a lot of broad use cases, not the narrow, deep use cases that we all are looking for, right? And it depends on the costs of actually doing it. You know, you have a confident bullshitter model that actually says confidently saying. It's okay, you can have that medication, you shouldn't have any issue. Because guess what it's trained on? It's trained on somebody in Quora answering that in a, in a forum. It's also trained on the medical literature. Yes. It doesn't know to differentiate between the two. You don't know yep. whether you should draw your inspiration for generating that content from yep. only PubMed kind of a corpus, or should you also use that from you know, the chat, you know, Twitter? Right, Twitter Absolutely. feed. Right? So you can't really tell. Now I know there is like Meta launched that whole retrieval augmentation, uh, you know, paper that talks about how do you narrow the scope of generation and things like that. But I think, mm -hmm. in general, I do believe that I'm very bullish about this whole space using large language models. But then you have to build the the right guardrails and stuff around, so, and that the architecture, the large language models, are mostly based on a transformer architecture, which is mm -hmm. what we use the simple the simplest architecture to actually support multiple tasks around a you know general purpose model for any of the other tasks we use the same thing too so that's you know we definitely you touched upon that that's actually interesting i love the approach what you said which is anything where you can actually have 
and reduce the burden of a physician or a patient in like, you know, being able to, you know, do the lookup and search and things like that, that whole place is ready for disruption with a large, wide, broad model. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I think um, what on, on that note, uh, one of the interesting things, if you look at how people, most people are using GPD, chat GPD today, is actually, a, you know, they, they, they use it for like a memory tool. It has memorized what's in the internet. So I'm going to search and then get the answer that I want in it, right? Mm-hmm. They're not really mm-hmm. using for reasoning kind of problems, which is what like optimization problem, reasoning problem are the problems that we do like outside in these narrow domains. So I do believe though the evolution of how fast these things are evolving will start building those kind of capabilities very quickly and very soon on it. But then you'll have to give the, the toolkit for people to narrow down the scope Train yes. train it, transfer learn from that to a smaller domain, all of that kind of stuff. So I think that's customized it. versions of it. Customized. There's going to be a lot of different customized versions of yeah, depending on, right. depending on the use case. Exactly. No, it's pretty pretty. The future is so bright. One question on that uh, regard: What do you think of the uh, the latest um, the letter that is circulating that you know Elon Musk has signed it, Ben uh, uh, Benji Ashir has signed it, which is like, you know, hey, pass all the greater than GPT-4 research right now so the regulation and the guardrails can catch up? Um, I, um, I understand the, you know, the concern, but uh, it's not going to happen. I don't think you can pause anything. What you got to do is, again, um, you got to actually change these procedures which we have in place for putting, um, you know, um, constraints, maybe um, compliance uh, type of uh, regulations, they actually, I think what needs to happen is you cannot slow uh, slow down technology. You have to speed up, you know, those procedures. So yeah. that's my thought on it. I mean, I'm, I'm a true believer yeah. in, you know, that that's a, basically that's what I would say. Yeah, no. And, and I think, you know, there's no guarantee if you pass it in six months, they're going to catch up on things that we knew were coming 10 Nothing years. Nothing is going to happen. I mean, look, I mean, we, we want to like we think about it. So many different things, even on healthcare and other stuff. What's going on in the Congress? Right. They can never agree on anything. So what, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, that's so true. Um, last question in, the, in that vein of things. Um, artificial general intelligence. Do you think chat GPT is AGI? Um, I don't think so. Um, my thought is like, again, I mean, these models are as good as, you know, the data they're trained on. Sure. And I, and then again, I mean, if you go deep into, you know, reasoning and logic, these are not the models who can do reasoning for you. It's different reasoning. I don't think we have found any way, like you said, rightfully so, like, Chat GPT is just tra- like a transformer based model. Maybe, you know, they added like more layers and stuff like that, but there's nothing revolutionary in terms of the architecture. I don't think we have found any mathematical way of uh, replicating what reasoning is in our, in our brain. So I, in my mind, these are different things. And because of that, uh, I think um, th- these are separate areas totally, completely. And I, maybe in the future we find a way uh, to do that, but chat GPT right. is, not, is not that for sure. No, I, you know, I love the way where you brought it down to first principles, which is like, can you represent the mathematically the model for reasoning? And the answer is no, not yet. No. Right. So, so exactly. as a, you know, as a result, I mean, um, it is not AGI. And I, I think it makes perfect sense. I actually buy that argument from you uh, very well. So, you know, what's exciting for you uh, these days, other than the new job and the new uh, thing, like what's exciting for you? I'm going to all the put it, like I said, I mean, all these low hanging fruits that I want to go for and really, you know, uh, make a difference in, in like, at least for, for me, for, for healthcare generally, for just my own sake, it just really, it's rewarding. It's, it's very, um, it, it makes me happy. It makes me, it get, you know, it gets me excited. Um, you know, like I said, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on digital health domain, you know, using wearables, building analytics on top of data you collect from wearables, you know, doing like these um, new um, uh, modalities of data collection in trial clinical trials and other applications yeah um, this is so much this is new this is a new area but again it gets me excited because we do have we have had always at least the math was there 
signal processing, digital signal processing is very well developed. Feedback control is very well developed. You just have found like these new uh, domains where you can use those tools uh, and plus AI uh, and machine learning based tools and, and basically um, do a lot of new things which are going to help everybody. Uh, that's basically what uh, gets me super excited. No, it's uh, it's definitely we live in more than anything very very exciting times, and uh, the the future is so bright. You need shades these days, you know. So it's there's so many so many opportunities, and and the opportunity to make a positive impact to humankind in healthcare with these powerful technologies is, you know, I think that unites the two of us, right? So it's our absolutely future. we're gonna go make this happen. Where can the viewers and listeners find you on the internet? How can they get in touch with you on the internet? Um, I have a LinkedIn account. That's all I have. I'm not on any other um, social, social platforms. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also do a lot of speaking. You also do a lot of speaking and you're actually, you know, in a lot of places, I'm sure. And, you know, I do attend a lot of different conferences, healthcare related uh, conferences, specifically applications of AI and data science. Um, I'm going to be in Los Angeles next week and then I'll be in, like, uh, I think there, there is a conference in Santa Clara that comes in. In uh, I think September, I'm going to be in Vegas uh, later on, uh, maybe in October time. Yeah, uh, all these uh, you know different it's, AI related conferences for healthcare. It's exciting, Amir. Thank you for a very very deep thoughtful discussion on this topic. I really appreciate it, and Absolutely. I'm sure the audience is going to appreciate this a lot. So thanks so much. Absolutely, for I was so um, honored to, to to be speaking with you.